So I want to talk today about easily one of the most disturbing, if not the most disturbing experiences of my whole life. Uh, this happened about 10, 12 years ago. I had just come to South Korea and the opportunity presented itself to go to North Korea. So I had to stop and think about this for a second because I had to like weigh out the moral dilemma of this. On one hand, I knew that I'd be giving money to Kim Jong-il and his regime and in a sense further allowing them to enslave uh, their people. But on the other hand, I thought that I might be able to accomplish more if I could go there and talk about the issue firsthand. It was ironically very expensive there and they, they try to get as much money out of you as humanly possible, which just really went to go and show you the irony of the whole situation that you had a communist government, but you know, the, the, the leaders at the top were obsessed with capitalism and hoarding things for themselves. But, you know, I decided to go there and, um, I want to talk about a couple of things that I saw that was just like, wow, like the whole experience really from beginning to end was just like hard to even put it into words. Um, I can try, I've tried to write about it, but it really, I can't really do the experience justice, but I will try um, as I can right now. But let's just say when you first get there, they put you in like this processing center and then they just have this music playing on loop. It's, um, it's called Pangat uh, Sumida and um, it means nice to meet you. It goes Dong Po Yorabun Jung Je Yorabun Iroke Manani Pangap Sumida. It's a song that they welcome like the South Koreans. But I mean, the weird thing was they had it on loop for like an hour. So, okay, get the processing, go outside. And the next thing you know is they send some troops marching by your bus. So like, you know, do not even think about messing around because they're, they're marching through. And one of them, he kept like going for his gun, like faking you out. And so when we got off, like one of these soldiers, as, as I was coming along, I'm not sure if he probably knew that I was American, but he was just staring me down. Like, and I was like, oh my God, I was so uncomfortable. But, and I just kind of like, you know, put my head down and, and walked away. But the uh the someone told me later on like that guy just started laughing his butt off whenever you left him but anyway that was like the first little encounter and then i've tried to explain this to people but it's, it's so weird because they would take you to spots and then they would like make a a circle around you with people like a human circle making sure you couldn't go anywhere. They had soldiers, they had tour guides, and it's just it was just so weird, you know, like they, they'll show you one place, but you can't interact with the people. They let you know that if you talk to the people, they're gonna fine you like $50. If you spit, they'll fine you $50. If you try to take like some leaf or rock, they'll find everything they've tried to find you $50. Another interesting story is they make you change your money before you go in there and you, cause you can't use Korean money. So I exchanged for us dollars. The us dollars was like what they really, everybody had to exchange their money to us dollars. It's what they wanted, but they actually gave me a bunch of $2 bills, which is so weird. Cause you know, if you're American, you only have $2, uh, you very rarely see $2 bills, but I, I had like a stack of like a hundred dollars of $50, uh, $2 bills, but so they take you to like a hotel and this like little mock city. I mean, I've told people like what a mock city looks like. And I guess you can say kind of like a movie. If I was going to compare it to something, it'd be like a movie set because they had like a hotel. It was just kind of like a square. I guess you can say like a, like a quad. On every side, they had like something, but it's like you're the only one there. Like your group is there's a couple hundred people, but like there's no one else like living in this area. They they, they basically 
they had on the other side was like this really small Korean village and Korean, um, you know, I guess they would come there to work, but I mean, you could tell it was like, like a mock village. Like they, it just wasn't real. So, you know, they let you know that you have certain areas you can walk and, um, you know, you can walk on certain paths and they're like marked off and, I mean, they gave you a slight bit more amount of freedom there because there was like a Jimjilbang, which is like a public bathhouse. I mean, I go to these things every single week. They're just so relaxing. There's natural water in there. It, they have saunas, uh, you have sweating rooms. I mean, it's just, it's an amazing experience, but uh, I did wind up going there. But so they said you can walk over here and you can like go see these areas, but you know, you can't do it, whatever you want to do, but you know, just, just times you just be driving and seeing stuff like something is not like right here. Like if you've ever seen the movie children of the corn, it's a very, very analogous to like what's going on. Cause you know, things are, things are dead. Um, in fact, the even fields that you could see were like yellow. Because there's like the things were dead. And if you know anything about North Korea, they don't have access to like a lot of oil. So a lot of people don't have cars. You basically see everybody riding around on their bikes. And or walking. And then, I mean, I, I, I mean, we saw a guy driving a motor, oh no, driving a car. But the car... They had a fire, like the hood was off of it, and they had like a fire going on there. And the 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 um, our tour guide is like, he's like he's like crying, because he's explaining like this is the only place in the world that I mean, I've been a lot of countries I've never seen something like that before, and he's like just so distraught because you know he's South Korean and he knows what kind of abundance is in South Korea, and I guess that's one of the things that really strikes you because if you go into South Korea. I call it the land of a thousand lights because everywhere you look, there is a neon light going. I mean, it's obnoxious, but everywhere you turn your head, there's some kind of technology, something like this or that. I mean, it just, it blows me away as, as, a, as an American to see that much technology in a country. But there, everything was like, was like literally like you're back like 60, 70, 80 years ago. I mean, it was literally like that far back in time. And, you know, it's just an eerie feeling. Like, I, I posted a, a video because they said, like, you can't film while you're in the bus. But um, I put the video, like, I hung it around my neck as, as like, a necklace. And I turned it on and I was, like, filming like this. So, you can see the video. It's like this propaganda piece. And um, it's of this young girl, this young school girl. And she's young and she says grandmother let's go destroy our number one enemy which is the united states if you think about it, it's actually brilliant the fact that they're saying well look even our school children and our grandmothers could destroy you know america because they wind up brainwashing the people there to thinking they're the most powerful like everywhere else is basically like a wasteland so they're really against them having access to like music or movies that would show that what the government is telling them is just an absolute lie. But, you know, and I, and I think about it now, this is one of the reasons why they didn't want us interacting with the North Korean people. So when I, when we, when I was walking on that path that they said, like, like they explained it like this, like you have the path that you can walk on and then the North Korean people have their paths that they can walk on. So it's kind of like a maze, man. But so as we're going through it, we come up to an intersection and the people see us and we see the North Korean people like the civilians and we see each other and our eyes just go wide. And, and like I'm with my group of people, some other tourists there and the, the North Korean people are looking at us and they're like, 
they're, they're probably 10 times more scared of us than we're scared of them because they actually have, not that they're afraid of us, but they know that they can get some kind of like harsh punishment. We'll probably get kicked out of the country, like maybe find some money, but their, their punishment could be much, much, much worse, like torture or death. But so as we're staying there, standing there, like some other guy, a, a, a guard came blowing a whistle and he, he's like, get out of here. Like he told us to go first. So, you know, we went and I, we were just like, oh my God, like it was, it was just one of those things that catches you off guard. But as I was walking away, I was like, I literally have never seen a situation where people were being like, I would call it being like herded, like animals saying like where you can and can't go. And I was thinking the only time I've ever seen that, like in any case, would be like when they have the cattle and they're at a, at a at an auction and, you know, they have like little pins for the animals to go through. And I was like, that is so bizarre that like human beings are being treated like that. And then I started to think about it because like whenever I was there, I was an atheist and um like hardcore hardcore atheist and i mean even when i was there i mean i i wind up getting drunk like off honey beer we were drinking with some north korean officials and i mean we got really drunk and you know i, I just i was in a really bad state headspace in my time in my time there but for for many years but i started to think about this and i thought like in my atheism this actually makes sense. Like Kim Jong-un or Kim Jong-il at the time was treating these people the way you would treat an animal because he's more highly evolved. In his mind, he thought he was more highly evolved or, you know, higher up on the evolutionary ladder. And, you know, just in the same way we'd use a sheep and skin off the, the skim off, the, you know, the, the wool of a sheep or milk a cow or take the eggs of chickens. They're using these people and uh, this isn't an argument that I'm making like, okay, so therefore there's a, there's a God. I'm telling you, like I, in my own mind, in my own skin, could not reconcile that with my atheism. And it's not as though I became a Christian as a result of that. That happened in 2008 and, and I didn't become a Christian until 2014. So that was six years after. I mean, it, it was just one of those things where you come to a crossroads in your life. And I, I literally refer to that in the writing, like as a crossroads of humanity, where we came into a crossroads. But it did, and it did make me think about things in a certain way. And it's just kind of like one of those times that just makes you stop and like, okay, am I, can I really keep going on and living my life like this? And it was a big crack in the ceiling, you know, like I remember when I came to South Korea initially, I was riding a motorcycle with, uh, with my friend from, he was actually from Bible college as well. And, um, he, he had a, a helmet on and, and one of those things for like the jackets that have like the shell covering in the back and he was taking me like a hundred miles an hour, man. And I was like, okay, if I die right now, like, I know God enough to the point that I've just, I'm going to go to hell. Like, I'm like, there's no way around it. I'm going to hell the way that I'm living my life. And I, and I got off and I was like, you know, I know the way that I'm living my life and, and I know it's wrong and I, and I understood it, but it's just one of those things like you just don't want to give your life to God. You don't want to stop doing the things that you're doing. And for me, it was like, okay, I can't say I'm an atheist anymore, but I know this is, a, this is totally wrong. And I can't articulate it within my atheism. So, you know, it was a big crack in the ceiling. Um, I had a few more come and then I had God just totally come and get his hands on me, change my life. But when I got back to South Korea, um, I wind up meeting some North Koreans from 
I wind up just randomly meeting the Minister of Culture's uh, wife. And she was actually at, at a Jim Jobang, out of all places. I met her at a Jim Jobang. And so she was telling me that they just came from like this North Korean group. And I was like, oh man, I would love to get involved. So wind up supporting one of the families there uh, financially. And um, we also did things like teaching English to the kids and just having various uh, uh, drives to to get like food and clothes or whatever. But, you know, I also got to tell some of the stories. I mean, you can see some more of the stories on my channel. You know, it's th it was Thanksgiving this week. And, see, Thanksgiving was Thursday, today, Sunday. And, and I was just thinking, like, even if you don't have a lot, like, the fact that you can wake up and do something like eat food and have clean running water, you don't even realize, like, how blessed you are in so many different ways you know as bad as your life is there are people who would trade their lives with you in a heartbeat you know I mean I've seen I've been to Haiti I've seen some of the most unbelievable conditions that people live in so I know that I'm not out of line to say that that that's that that's true you know like it I've seen it firsthand I've seen it in North Korea I've seen that oppression because you know sometimes I might talk about America and I might talk about like the arrogance and the pride and the materialism that comes out of America and the filth that winds up going around the world. And I might run against the government just because I've seen things from a different perspective overseas. But situations like that, you're like, man, those people are being prevented from being what they could be. You know, like they're not given the opportunity to think and to travel and to explore and for all the bad things we might say about America, like one thing that America has been amazing at is, is giving its citizens opportunities to do things, you know, whether it's travel, whether it's getting education. And I living overseas, how I'm going to be so grateful for that, you know. But it's, of course, it's out of love that I might talk about some things that, you know, need to be addressed because if you just say we're the best, we're the greatest and all that stuff, it doesn't really help you, you know. You may think it helps you, but, but it really doesn't, not it, not even slightly, because if you get to that point, then you're just going to think, I know everything, and I can't learn from anyone else, or, um, you know, just in your, in your own personal life, if that's the way you behave, then you're going to be like a narcissistic person, and you're going to say, well, I'm more valuable than other people. So, you know, I think in life just we got to say everybody has value everybody has um you know worth in god's eyes like it, even if we can't even if the government doesn't accept people's worth we got to say in god's eyes these people have worth so it's part of the reason why i'm making this video i didn't talk about it for many years because it was like i mean put it like this like two weeks afterwards I would have like nightmares and I would wake up like in the middle of the night and like a cold sweat and, and I was dreaming about that I was back there stuck in North Korea.